So some of you may not know this, but there are three different versions of the paleontology French theory's iceberg. The original version is pretty cluttered, a bit hard to navigate, and has slightly more entries than its second version. The second version, the one that I've been covering in my series, is a bit cleaner, a bit more condensed, a few less entries, still not the easiest to navigate through. The third version, retitled to the weird paleontology iceberg to better fit the more broad range of entries, is definitely the cleanest and best best looking iceberg out of the three. It's condensed down by a lot but still lengthy with even a few new topics added, and it's the one whose tiers are easiest to navigate through. I remember getting a suggestion a while back to cover the newest version of the iceberg, and initially I didn't think that was a bad idea. But when I took a look at the chart recently, I realized that most of the entries on there was stuff I've already covered or am going to cover in my current series, so I thought it was pointless to do. But then I thought, why not combine all of the unused entries from the first version of the iceberg with the newer ones on the newest version, and just use that to make a mini bonus episode episode for my overall series. So consider this extra episode as a thank you for supporting the series and an apology for all of the things I got wrong in it. It's not a lot, and I doubt it'll be very long like my usual episodes are, but looking through the list, there's still a variety of entries here that will give you guys a similar experience as my main series. So let's not ramble anymore, let's take a look at the bonus tier of the Paleontology Fringe Theories Iceberg. Gilmore's Stegosaurus Charles Gilmore was an American paleontologist from the late 1800s to the early 1900s, who's best known for the several monographs he made for various different dinosaur specimens, one of them being on the Stegosaurus in 1914. Based on what I could find, there was actually nothing too crazy or out of the ordinary with Gilmore's writings on it. In fact, one of the main things that was referenced during my search for this topic was Gilmore's obscure model reconstruction of the Stegosaurus. And the reconstruction is also nothing too outlandish, it gives the Stegosaurus a slightly different look from what it was generally known for at the time, and it would be one of the ones that would come after Frank Bond's infamous Stegosaurus recreation that I mentioned earlier in the main Iceberg series. Again, while the reconstruction itself is nothing too grand, which is probably one of the reasons why it wasn't included in the second version, there was one unlikely place Gilmore's Stegosaurus was mentioned. It was used in a newspaper article that introduced a pretty weird quote-unquote theory about the use of the plates on the Stegosaurus's back which posited that they were used for flying or gliding. This is something that will actually pop up in the final episode of the series, so I'll go more in depth with the article then. But in regards to Gilmore's Stegosaurus, you can kind of just see it chilling there on the top left corner of the page. Okay, so when I first wrote the script for this video, I honestly couldn't find out what made this model reconstruction significant enough to be put here on the iceberg. I know it was taken out, indicating there was most likely not much on it, but doing one last stretch of research, I did actually find something that might explain why it was on here. According to this blog site, extinctmonsters.net, Gilmore created a model that was essentially a perfect match to the actual skeleton of the dinosaur implying that he got the dimensions and even the plate positions down to the last measurement, meaning this model recreation, at least in this point in time, was the most accurate depiction of the Stegosaurus. And the model was to size as well, as you can see from this picture of it right next to the Stegosaurus skeleton. Now, the design is outdated, but it's always cool to see paleontologists go above and beyond in their line of work, going the extra mile to create something like this. Old Away Man. The Old Away Man was a discovery made in 1913 in the paleoanthropological site known as the Olduvai Gorge. I think that's how you pronounce it. What was significant about this find is that the deposit in which the bones were found in dated them to be over 700,000 years old, which was around the middle Pleistocene, and the bones belonged to a Homo sapien. It's generally accepted that Homo sapiens didn't emerge until around 300,000 years ago, meaning this discovery was essentially saying that that Homo sapiens emerged much earlier than we first thought. However, you can probably already tell this discovery brought in a lot of controversy to the man who studied it, which was Professor Hans Gottfried Reck, a paleontologist who was working at the Humboldt University of Berlin at the time. 
And rightfully so, because the remains and the deposits it was discovered in would be re-examined with different results. But even before that, there was evidence that supported this wasn't actually a much older Homo sapien, mainly with the condition of the skeleton. When it was discovered, it was discovered whole, which would be very uncommon for something to have died in the wild. Usually the remains would be fragmented or in pieces from being worn from environmental conditions and scavengers. This was an observation made by Kenyan British archaeologist and anthropologist Louise Leakey, who grew fascinated with the find and its controversy. Leakey would visit the site himself and study the different bed layers and would end up finding evidence that this was most likely a burial ground for the old away man who was intentionally put there. But the bed they found it in was dated back 700,000 years ago, so how was this possible? Well, a simple look at this graph is all you really need to know how it was possible to make that mistake. It was most likely put there on purpose as a burial ground, which seems to be the most commonly accepted answer, and it just happened to be put in an area that dates back to that time period. Nowadays, the discovery is dated back to the more reasonable time frame of 20,000 years ago. Conrad's Skull Ed Conrad is an amateur fossil enthusiast who's convinced that he discovered hominid or possibly even human remains within coal banks that date back to the Carboniferous period. So yeah, not much I could find with this one. The sources for it are pretty scarce. I kid you not, one of the sources I'm using for this entry is literally a Google Groups comment that seems to have archived an article on the matter, along with online forums talking about it and so on. To keep things simple, I'll just go through what I managed to find in my main sources. In 1981, while fossil hunting around Schuylkill County, Pennsylvania, Conrad would find what looked like the domed crown of a human skull. What's interesting about this is that it was discovered in a coal deposit dated back 300 million years ago during the time of the Carboniferous period. Man, if I had a nickel for every time someone found what they think are fossilized human remains and coal deposits dated back to the Carboniferous period, Period, I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice. Yeah, yeah, I'm funny, I'm cultured, I keep up with the means, what of it? Anyways, Conrad was convinced that he found something, and he was determined to look more into it, even having several qualified scientists examine, or at least telling them about the find itself. Well, at least according to my sources, which you should probably take with a grain of salt. And along with this apparent fossilized skull cap, he also claims that there are thousands of more remains and artifacts spanning across different locations, and has concluded that some, if not most of them, to be organic materials based on what he knows. According to one source, there were a few scientific figures from various institutions that examined and or discussed the matter with Conrad, who gave their two cents on his apparent hominid discovery. People from various Various institutions, including the Smithsonian Museum, the Harvard University's Museum of Comparative Zoology, and the National Science Foundation have disagreed with Conrad's assertions that his finds are organic, let alone human. One of these people, more specifically Dr. Raymond T. Rye II from the Smithsonian Institution, said that his finds were most likely just quartz that were in the shape of a human skull. Conrad wasn't really happy with these results, and instead of just accepting what the scientists were saying, he doubled down on his belief that these were human remains and spent years on researching and collecting more quote-unquote remains and data. Over time, he also began to develop a much more cynical view towards scientists in the field, losing all respect for them and seeing them as dishonest. Crosses Arcari in 1837, a very strange scientific phenomenon would occur by scientist Andrew Cross, who would experiment a lot with electricity specifically. During one of his experiments, he was attempting to find out if he could grow crystals with electric currents, but the results were not what he expected. His goal was to grow crystals, but instead he ended up unintentionally creating insects. At least, that's how it appeared. His experiment setup included several components like lava stone, a chemical substance, substance, an electrical source, and it required him to wait on the experiment for several days, almost a full month, to see the results. For days, nothing appeared in the liquid, but around the 28th day, he saw what he apparently described as the perfect insect, standing erect on a few bristles which formed its tail. 
Despite the implications of the test, Cross wasn't entirely convinced this was the case, and instead assumed some kind of microscopic insect eggs were somehow within one or more of the components used in the experiment, even though he also claims he didn't see any when he first examined them prior to the setup. Cross would replicate what he had done to see if it really worked, and he experimented with different substances, even ones that were poisonous and impossible for life to thrive within, most of which were actually successful, at least according to my source. He would examine and identify the newly created insects, which would resemble close to that of mites. And he would even give it a name, which is the Acarus crossy. He would also mention the experiment to some colleagues and or friends, which would start a domino effect of more and more people finding out about it. Soon, newspaper outlets were covering the story, and unsurprisingly, Cross would receive a lot of backlash for his unintentional creations. A lot of people condemned and accused him for blasphemy, as they got the impression that him essentially creating life was an attempt to play God, the original creator of life in their eyes. Others were skeptical of the experiment, and some scientists even tried to recreate it, allegedly with successful results. The controversy eventually got Cross to speak out against the idea that he was at all intentionally trying to create life within his experiment, saying, I assure you most sacredly that I have never dreamed of any theory sufficient to account for the insect's appearance. I confess that I was not a little surprised, and am so still, and quite as much as when the insects first made their appearance, I was looking for crystal formations, and the insects appeared instead. In truth, there was a lot of mystery to this whole ordeal, organic life was created with inorganic materials. But Cross wasn't ever able to explain how this was possible or was even completely sure of what he saw in his vial that day. If I were to guess, I would say the amount of backlash he got made him second guess his experiment to the point where he was no longer even sure what he discovered that day, and he was probably too intimidated to recreate the experiment again out of fear of how people would react to the results. And if my sources and personal assumptions are true, I wouldn't blame him, because it's also said that he spent the better part of the rest of his life as a recluse, not wanting to go outside to face the constant, unwarranted hate and criticism towards his works. It seems, for whatever reason, there hasn't been a modern recreation of this experiment, so at this point in time, it's not really known for sure whether this outcome is true or not. At least, that's the impression I'm getting with the sources I found on the topic. Flying Dimetrodon Pairs This one definitely has to be a joke entry, but basically this is a speculative parody drawing for another possible use for the sale on a Dimetrodon's back. As you can see, a pair of Dimetrodons essentially hug each other belly to belly, and somehow jump off a high place and use their sails as wings to glide their way to the ground. The only presence of this post I could find was on Reddit, which states that the original artist went by the name Bradiosaurus, Br Bradiosaurus on DeviantArt. But looking into that account will only lead to a dead page. Luckily, with the power of the Wayback Machine, I was able to find what the original post entailed. Simply titled Dimetrodon Volans, it's nothing too specific, but the description reads, Inspired by that British documentary Walking with Monsters, prequel to Walking with Dinosaurs, in which baby Dimetrodon are depicted scampering up into trees. For some reason, I imagine two of the mini Dimetrodon linking together to form a glider, which is completely absurd and stupid. And apparently this was posted all the way back in 2007. So yeah, just a funny little gag post jokingly speculating how baby Dimetrodons probably got around. Jackalope Spider Hoax Yet another fossil hoax, this time being on what was originally thought to be a large quote-unquote jackalope of a Cretaceous spider from the Yixian Formation of China. In 2019, a team of scientists would give this unknown species of spider this name. And when you see the specimen at first glance, it's very obviously a spider of some kind, right? Well, after consulting an outside source and using fluorensis microscopy, it was revealed that this prehistoric spider was not a spider at all, but actually a crayfish. The specimen, along with its paper, was given to Paul Selden, a professor of invertebrate paleontology in the Department of Geology at the University of Kansas, who almost immediately noticed inconsistencies within the find that raised some red flags. Some of these details included the oversized eyes, the lack of features commonly seen in spiders, and so on. 
In Selden's conclusion of the examination, it clearly wasn't a spider, and he suspected possible tampering of the fossil, as he's aware of the unfortunate issue of fossil forgeries that are rampant in paleontology. After looking at the specimen under the microscope, he would notice the back legs of this apparent spider were actually carefully drawn on there to make it seem authentic. The specimen would undergo fluorensis microscopy where the areas of yellow would reveal the paint used to create the back legs, along with other parts of the creature's body to give it a more arachnid look. It was concluded that this specimen was actually more likely to be a Cricoidoscalosis athis, a type of crayfish that was common in the Yixian formation. This specific specimen of the crayfish was in a position that looked almost spider-like. If you see other examples of fossilized crayfish, they have a similar similar position, where their tail fans curl up into an oval shape resembling something close to a spider's abdomen. Selden didn't really know what would become of this find, assuming it would just go back to China to be displayed as a possible example of how fossil forgery is a prevalent practice in that region. But he wasn't entirely sure, and due to this mysterious unknown fate of the fake spider fossil, Selden would compare it to the real-life jackalope rabbit myth, which is where the specimen gets its name. BP oil spill caused an Permian. Okay, so this one isn't exactly how it sounds. Upon first hearing the entry, you'd be forgiven if the first thought that came to mind was that this title was trying to imply the BP oil company caused the Permian mass extinction, because that's what I thought it was trying to allude to as well. But doing a little bit of research, I found out that it's not so much trying to list it as a cause, but more of an association. For those of you that don't know, the BP, or British Corporation, oil spill is cited as the largest marine oil spill in the world, tragically killing 11 people and millions of marine animals and causing billions of dollars worth of damages. It started in April of 2010, when natural gas broke through the man-made concrete barrier and rose up to the oil rig, which was called the Deepwater Horizon, where things would get even worse after it would ignite and light the whole structure ablaze. Following this initial disaster would be the oil leak, and for nearly three months, the oil flowed in the ocean as cleanup crews did their best to clear it up and close the leak. Okay, so what does this have to do with the Permian extinction? In July of that same year, an article written by someone named Terence Aim would come out titled Doomsday, How BP Gulf Disaster May Have Triggered a World-Killing Event. In this article, AIM makes parallels to the cause and destruction the oil spill had on the environment with that of the Permian extinction, an event that led to the death of 96% of all life on Earth during that point in time. According to AIM, the end of the Permian was met with the disastrous outcomes of a large undersea methane bubble that caused explosions and poison that contaminated the air. He also says the same event occurred several million years later during the late Paleocene era during an event known as the Late Paleocene Thermal Maximum, where the methane bubble once again broke and caused another extinction which is said to have lasted about 100,000 years. Now, he's associating these disasters with present-day events that could, in his mind, cause it to happen again. For example, the BP oil spill. And due to the outcome of the first two events, he believes it's reasonable to believe that another rupture of the methane bubble could cause another mass extinction. However, about a week after this initial article was released, another article came out debunking the claims made by AIM. In this article written by Anna Lee Newitz called Methane Bubble Doomsday Story Debunked, it states that there are methane bubbles located under the ocean floor, but they simply don't have the power to cause a mass extinction event. Newitz had chatted with a couple of scientists on the matter, who were Dave Valentine and Chris Reddy, with the former saying this, During our recent cruise to the Gulf, we observed significantly elevated levels of methane at water depth greater than 2,500 feet, in the vicinity of the Deepwater Horizon spill site. While the total quantity of methane and other hydrocarbons is enough to cause problems with the regional ecosystem, there is no plausible scenario by which this event alone will cause global scale extinctions. In other words, in regards to a methane bubble, we humans are, for the most part, safe. 
Newitz even mentions that the claims of the methane bubble causing the Permian mass extinction was also heavily exaggerated. Of course, that shouldn't take away from the fact that an outcome of an event, even if it does have small-scale effects on the world, is still a pretty big deal as it can still kill a lot of ocean life. And that was the bonus tier of the Paleontology Fringe Theories Iceberg. Not as long as my typical videos, I know, but hopefully this was still a nice little bit of extra content to you guys. I'll admit there were some entries that I wanted to put in this video, but I just couldn't find anything on them. I tried contacting the creator of the iceberg about at least one of these entries, but I'm yet to get a response, so instead of just putting an empty topic in the video, I just excluded them entirely. Who knows, maybe I can make a another follow-up one of these days, but don't expect it anytime soon. In terms of this series, I have to focus on the final episode now. Well, not, not now. I'm probably going to take a little bit of a break before I get started, but you know what I mean. I have no idea when this final episode is going to come out, but consider this bonus episode a thank you slash apology in advance, just in case it takes me a really long time to get out. I don't know why I'm telling you guys this. I've already mentioned this in the end of the last video. Anyways, thank you all for watching and have a nice day.